Hello, this is Al Merrill at Georgia Tech, and welcome me to this Lipid Maps webinar on the discussion of approaches to interpretation of data from sphingolipidomic analysis. I want to thank Lipid Maps for allowing us to speak on this subject, as well as the other group that has publicized it, the Sphingolipid Biology Webinar Series, and the spank, thank the sponsor for this, Avanti Polar Lipids. This is the third in a series of webinars on sphingolipids that have been presented uh, for lipid maps. The first was on basic sphingolipidology, structures, metabolism, function, and disease, part two, analytical methods and challenges. And now the third designed to talk about once one has the data, how one would approach uh, the understanding of it. As a couple of housekeeping points, this webinar is scheduled for one hour will include question and answers at the end. The way the Q&A will be handled is if you submit your questions on the Q&A function of Zoom, then we will uh, answer them at the end of the presentation uh, as best we can with the amount of time that's allowed. And if your question's not addressed, you could uh, send it to an, uh, by email to one of the presenters. This webinar is being recorded and will later be made available via the Lipidomics Gateway. Due to the large number of registrants attendees will be automatically muted. The presenters want to thank Valerie O'Donnell, the director of the Lipid Maps, as well as Carolyn Reddy and Jeff Jukes for helping us in the preparation of this webinar. So you've conducted a lipidomics analysis and have a lot of data on sphingolipids. lipids. What the question then becomes is what does it mean? Before we move to the interpretation of the, what the changes in sphingolipids might mean, I want to make a couple of points. One that's critical is to back up and say, how rigorously have the structures that you think that you've identified uh, been verified as what that you think they are? And related to that, we'll talk a bit about the quantities that it seem to change. This is important because there are a lot of examples among sphingolipids of species that um, are in source decomposition products or arise from a lot of uh, re, re, uh, sources of information that aren't actually identifying them as sphingolipids. One thing that one sees in the literature a lot are uh, data from lipidomic studies identifying a sphingolipid as being the most uh, prominent biomarker for something. And it has a very improbable structure, particularly in something like the sphingoid base backbone, which tends to uh, have a fairly uh, narrow span of chain length, a uh, number of double bonds, uh, hydroxyl groups, that sort of thing, which have been summarized in previous uh, uh, presentations on uh, sphingolipids, and there'll be a little bit more about it here. And so if one sees something with a 31 carbon sphingoid base backbone, for example, it's very unlikely that that truly is a sphingolipid. In the odd case that it might be, it would be from a, a very interesting uh, source, perhaps something in the diet. And so I think before one that reports uh, uh, compounds as sphingolipids, you should double check it against a probable species. Another uh, classic example is in uh, determining whether or not a carbohydrate is in fact a, gl a glucosyl a carbohydrate or a galactosyl carbohydrate or any of a number of other isomers. And that has a very great importance in thinking about the origin of the glycosphingolipid, um, glucosyl ceramides being made by different enzymes and having different trafficking than galactosyl ceramides, et cetera. So those are uh, classic uh, cases. Some places that you would be able to find more information about structures are the Lipid Maps website itself, Lipid Bank, Swiss Lipids, and the Consortium for Functional Glycomics. On the side of the quantitation, it's important to think about uh, all the different uh, ways that one might think that quantities are different, but it might be an artifact, uh, for example, of the sample preparation that can lead to extraction uh, uh, inefficiencies, uh, the biophysical properties of a particular sphingolipid might be such that it has a low uh, 
efficiency for extraction and, and that efficiency can be modified by other components of the biological material so that you have two different groups that you're comparing and what the sphingolipid might look like it changes, but it doesn't really change. It's change, appearing to change because of the other components of the uh, biological material. Uh, and then as one's looking at the uh, differences, if, assuming they are correctly extracted, whether you're dealing with relative differences or quantified amounts. For further discussion of these topics, the, the, the issue of lipid quantitation has been discussed in great depth by Robert Murphy. Uh, and as well, there's an organization that has been set up to deal with uh, lipidomic standards uh, to try to get to a more rigorous and uh, exact way of quantifying the data. There was even an interesting uh, article presented in ASBMB today last year, looking at the topic of harmonizing lipidomics, meaning uh, coming up with uh, consistent standards for how you would um, address these sorts of questions. So once you think that you know, you've verified that the compounds that you're looking at are really sphingolipids lipids and the amount differences that you're seeing are real and not an artifact of the analysis, there's a lot of things, of course, that they might be related to uh, The changes can affect the biophysical changes of, in membrane properties. It can be related to uh, metabolism trafficking. It can have impacts on multiple cell regulatory pathways, cell-cell interactions, and even more physiologic processes and pathophysiologic processes than here. So the next question becomes, as you're thinking about this, how deeply do you want to uh, understand what's going on with these molecules? Do you want to know just enough, say, to make a comment about it in the discussion section of a manuscript? In which case, if that, that's where you want to go, then probably the best way to get information quickly about the compounds that you're seeing is to go to uh, sources like the previous Lipid Maps webinar, this Lipid Maps webinar, and as well to look at a number of fairly basic overview articles about sphingolipids, which I'm giving on this slide, but that will not go over them. Rather, I'm just posting it here so that you could go back to the recorded version of this webinar and scan down through the list as you, and look them up as you wish. The alternative, of course, is that you wanna go farther, all the way down to a complete understanding of what these changes in lipids mean. And to deal with that subject, I've brought in two experts, far more than I, to talk about what are things that you want to consider. Yusuf Hanoon, Director of the Stony Brook Cancer Center, and Joel Kennedy, Professor in Cancer Research, and Charles Luberto, Associate Professor in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics at Stony Brook. So at this point, I'll turn the uh, screen and the microphone over to Yusuf and Chiara. Thank you, Al. Um for a very nice introduction. Uh, and I'll pick up from where Al left. Chiara and I will, uh, will present this in tandem. I'll do some of the basic uh, infrastructure, so to speak, of single lipids uh, in terms of significance and metabolism and complexities. And then Chiara will primarily address the issues, how to approach and tackle those. Um, this slide just simply indicates that a main reason why folks are interested in sphingolipids, not the only reason, but the main, a main reason is that many sphingolipids are bioactive. These include things such as ceramides, sphingosine, and sphingosine phosphate. Uh, the enzymes that regulate those, uh, sphingomyelinases, ceramidases, mm -hmm. sphingosine kinases, are in turn reg respond to various stimuli as indicated on the top of the slide. Uh, and these include all kinds of uh, stress stimuli for sphingomyelinases and ceramidases and growth factors and cytokines for uh, sphingosine kinase. Uh, and then the bioactive lipids have been implicated in a variety of cellular responses. Uh, such as uh, senescence and apoptosis for ceramides, uh, apoptosis growth arrest for sphingosine, and migration and proliferation angiogenesis for sphingosine phosphate. Uh, so this is all 
nice and we know therefore that these molecules are of significance if you encounter them in your studies. In addition, single lipids such as sphingomyelin shown here and cerebrocytes and glycosphingolipids can play other roles as uh, components of membranes and uh, subcellular membranes as well for some glycosphingolipids as antigens and antigen receptors. Um, the, uh, the one area that has come into sharp focus uh, recently has been the appreciation of an increasing number of inherited diseases related to mutations in specific enzymes of sphingolipid metabolism. Uh, these are shown here in the red uh, rectangles. Uh, hereditary sensory neuropathy for mutations in serine palmitoyl transferase, uh, erythrokeratoderma for uh, three keto reductase, and so on and so forth. I will not go over all of these, but these are simply the inherited uh, diseases associated with enzyme defects. On top of that, there are dozens of acquired diseases that have implicated uh, bioactive sphingolipids, cardiovascular diseases, uh, cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, immune disorders, and inflammation. <clears throat> but going back to how to advance our understanding uh, mechanistically and functionally of sphingolipids, uh, we'd like to understand how modules of sphingolipids function. Uh, so in its simplest formulation, a regulated enzyme can serve as a signaling module. Uh, it can receive input from an extracellular uh, stimulus or even intracellular stimulus, and by modulating levels of substrate or product, uh, it can regulate a target and therefore transduce an input into an output. This has been defined really best and historically first with the cyclase, cyclic A and B pathway, and subsequently with the phospholipase C diacylglycerol protein kinase C pathway. So we understand that regulated enzymes are indeed signaling transducers in a more generic uh, sense. Uh, however, unlike the cyclic AMP pathway, which for the most part in mammalian cells is a dedicated signaling module, meaning the primary function of cyclase is to make cyclic AMP in response to activation of uh, certain uh, G protein coupled receptors. Uh, and cyclic AMP in mammals primarily serves to activate protein kinase A, uh, and PKA then serves as the transducer. Unlike this paradigm, which makes its study very efficient in a way, there are several complexities that arise in sphingolipid studies. Uh, the first is that um, um, sphingolipid metabolism itself is complex. None of, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. None of the modules of enzymes of sphingolipid metabolism exists primarily as a signaling module or in, uh, in isolation from other aspects of sphingolipid metabolism. In fact, it's sphingolipid metabolism is a network. It's a complex network, but we be can begin to dissect it by conceptualizing it uh, into discrete modules. Uh, the first one called AA here is uh, the de novo synthesis module that starts with serine as a basic amino acid and palmitoyl CoA, condenses them, uh, and subsequently we reach all the way to dihydroceramide, then ceramide. Ceramide itself serves as a hub to uh, various pathways shown here as ceramide phosphate, uh, acyl ceramide, sphingomyelin glycoceramide and all the glycosphingolipids, but also can be broken down to sphingosine, which can be phosphorated to sphingosine phosphate, which in turn can be cleaved by sphingosine phosphate lyase uh, to, uh, to kind of get rid of sphingolipids by forming ethanolamine phosphate and a fatty aldehyde. Uh, sphingolipids are also distinguished by having very long chain fatty acids and that's module AH, uh, which generates the very long chain fatty acids. So in essence, there is primarily one or two entrances, if you will, into single lipids, AA and AH, and one exit, which is AG. A lot of stuff happens 
in between. And you can see that for most of these reactions, there are enzymes that move one way and enzymes that move in the opposite way. So these are interconnected and in a global sense, reversible metabolic pathways. Uh, now, as we talked a couple of slides ago, there are different bioactive sphingolipids and they are interconnected metabolically. Uh, and each of these has its potential uh, specific um, targets. Um, for example, sphingosine phosphate works on G-protein coupled receptors and possibly some intracellular targets. Ceramide works on phosphatases uh, and possibly catepsin D. Uh, sphingosine, we don't know exactly what it works on uh, and so on and so forth. But what we're learning beyond that is there is now a much more complex uh, layer to single lipid structure and potentially therefore single lipid function. Uh, there are, instead of thinking of one ceramide, there are dozens and dozens of ceramides. Uh, these can be distinguished by all the red stuff here, uh, the hydroxylation and methylation at the one position of the sphingoid base, the length of the sphingoid base, the desaturation, desaturation, and hydroxylation. Uh, the length of the acyl chain. I don't know if I can show the length of this acyl chain. Does my pointer show, Al? I want to make sure. Uh, yes. Yeah. The length of the acyl chain here. Again, it's desaturation, hydroxylation. Um, and you, these are multiplicative. First of all, they are products of specific enzymes that introduce double bonds or hydroxylations or different substrates, such as instead of using serine, SPT serine palmitol transferase can use alanine or glycine. So would either lose this hydroxyl or the methyl hydroxyl respectively. So these are products of discrete enzymes and therefore the output is combinatorial. So that's why we can have dozens and dozens and up to two to 300 possibly different ceramides in mammals uh, and dozens of uh, sphingoid bases, or at least several sphingoid bases, and then all kinds of complex sphingolipids. Uh, we are beginning to appreciate, for example, in the case of ceramides, that dihydroceramides may have their own functions related to reactive oxygen species or autophagy. A ceram C14 ceramide has functions such as the uh, unfolded protein response. C16 ceramide has been often implicated in apoptosis and cell adhesion more recently. C18 ceramide, in, uh, again, more recently in lethal autophagy. And the oxysphingolipids have been implicated in toxicity in general and neurotoxicity uh, specifically. And they are elevated uh, in the disease cent hereditary sensory neuropathy because they accumulate due to defects in serine palmitoid transferase. So this is another layer of complexity that we have multiple possible bioactive sphingolipids, not just specific classes such as ceramide, sphingoid base, or S S1Ps. Uh, <clears throat> the other, and that arises from the complexity of the metabolic pathways and their interconnectedness, is what we call metabolic ripple effects. Remember, we discussed one enzyme as a module in signaling processing or in information processing in the cell. If an input regulates this enzyme, let's say it's a ceramidase, it can take ceramide to sphingosine, and sphingosine can then work on a target and has a specific one or more responses. But if that input, or if the cell has high levels, let's say, of sphingosine kinase, that sphingosine may in turn be converted to sphingosine phosphate, which has its own set of functions in the cell and between cells, and therefore, the output in the cell is a composite of all these changes in the various sphingolipids. So again, when someone finds changes in sphingolipids, we find more often than not that changes are not restricted to one sphingolipid. So that's one challenge. How many sphingolipids are changing? What functions do they mediate? And how do we incorporate all these um, effects? Uh, and this comes, I mean, just also one point of, to go back to from this slide is we're showing here some relative 
uh, levels of these single lipids, and this, this is varies between cell and cell and tissue and tissue. But basically, for every 30,000 molecules of single myelin, one tenth of that is ceramide, so 3,000, and anywhere from one tenth to 100 uh, is fingosine. And compared to single myelin, one in 30,000 is present as fingosine phosphate. So for every molecule of sphingosine phosphate, there is 30,000 molecules of sphingomyelin. So one can appreciate that small changes in sphingomyelin can flood this pathway going from left to right. Uh, but that's why I think this is how come the, these enzymes are, appear to be tightly regulated so that the pathway can go here and stop or go through here or all the way through here or enter from here through here. It, it can be quite complex. And this is just looking at one specific module or three modules strung together. Um, another complexity is relates to, again, this low levels of these molecules, especially when we come to sphingosine, sphingosine phosphate. But then if we dissect the ceramides into the dihydroceramides and the individual species of ceramides and the oxydihydroceramides, we're also talking about very low levels uh, of these molecules. And Al Merrill in a previous uh, seminar discussed various um, mass spectrometry approaches to dissect uh, those, uh, th th those levels and structures of single lipids. Um, a, a final issue that um, can also be haunting for the non-lipidologist in general is unlike what one thinks of cyclic AMP, um, the lipids are lipids and they live, like to live in membranes. Uh, so for the most part, lipids live where they're made unless they're transported. They can be transported uh, by vesicular transport from one organelle to the other, or they can uh, uh, have specific protein transporters such as the ceramide transfer protein, which transfers it uh, from uh, the uh, ER to the Golgi. Uh, so there are various compartments of ceramide formation, uh, the ER and contiguous with the nucleus, uh, ER to Golgi. So in the ER, ceramide is formed from the de novo pathway in the Golgi single myelin and uh, glyco, sorry, glycosingle lipids are formed. And in the uh, lysosome, complex single lipids are broken down into ceramide and then sphingosine, uh, which can be reincorporated through the salvage pathway into uh, sphingolipids. lipids. Uh, and there are other specialized areas in the cell where there are enzymes of single lipid metabolism, such as the mitochondria, uh, or uh, the plasma membrane. And we, what brings that into sharp focus is that of the key hydrolytic enzymes in single lipid uh, metabolism, the sphingomyelinases and the ceramidases, which takes sphingomyelin to ceramide and sphingosine to sphing uh, and ceramidases, which takes sphingosine to sphingosine phosphate, there are at least five distinct enzymes that are products of distinct gene products and each one of them has its own compartmental identity, acid ceramidase in the lysosome, mitochondria, um, um, alkaline ceramidase in the Golgi, and other alkaline ceramidase in the ER, neutral ceramidase in mostly plasma membrane and Golgi, uh, and possibly in the mitochondria, and the same for sphingomyelinases. And therefore, one has to start thinking of compartment uh, specific functions. Now, how do investigators come to single lipid research? And as Al indicated or suggested, we are addressing here ourselves to people who are coming to single lipid research kind of de novo. Most of the time, uh, it appears that people stumble upon single lipids by one of two routes. Either they find changes in single lipid levels uh, in, uh, from either untargeted metabolomic or lipidomic approaches and or they find changes in sphingolipid gene expression um, or possibly um, mutations in some of the omic approaches such as proteomics or um, microarray or RNA-seq and so on and so forth. Uh, 
So how does one then, um, what for that at that point, how does one proceed? Um, what can we learn from these changes in these sphingolipids or their enzymes? And how do we interpret these changes? Uh, before I give the floor to Chiara, I just want to show this slide. And this kind of captures the key questions uh, Chiara will go over. Uh, what are the alterations in single lipid metabolism causing the observed changes in lipid levels? Uh, and here I'd like to present this approach, this conceptual approach to approaching a single lipid. One is what we call the enzyme centric approach, which is to define what are the key enzymes involved. This allows us to understand how the single lipid pathway is being regulated. You remember in our conceptualization of these pathways, the enzyme is what's being regulated. Uh, so it's an input. Uh, and if we understand that enzyme, we can understand its relationship to the input. But also enzymes for the non-lipidologists are a godsend because they provide tools to probe pathways over expression, downregulation, antibodies, mutation, etc. cetera. Um, and then obviously, eventually, they could emerge as possible therapeutic targets if they prove to be important in the biology or pathobiology of choice. However, we'd like to complement the enzyme-centric approach with a lipid-centric approach. Define what single lipids are changing, as this allows understanding of the functional end of the pathway. Remember, the, the enzyme is the entry, the lipid is what mediates the function. Then we go into the question of are the enzymes that control and modulate single lipids being regulated? Where in the cell are these changes occurring? And what are specific downstream targets? Um, at this point, I'll give the floor to Chiara, who will take it over from here. OK, um, thank you, Lipid Maps, Al, and Yusuf for the discussion so far. Um, so let's start with uh, assessing the changes in sphingolipid metabolism. So a couple of important concepts first, mass versus flux. And as um, Al mentioned, mass changes are determined mostly at this point by um, lipid, liquid chromatography in tandem with mass spectrometry. However, Steady state um, labeling with radioactive and isotopically labeled precursors can also allow measurements of relative mass levels. So once um, we add the labeled precursor and we incubate with cells long enough, the steady state is reached when the labeled and unlabeled pool of the target lipid are in equilibrium and therefore a difference um, between a control and a treatment is an indication of, also of uh, mass changes. Now, going back to changes in the mass, and now this has been done with uh, sphingolipidomics analysis and is an example. See, so these are um, MCF7 cells that have been treated with two different uh, doses of uh, uh, doxorubicin, one cytostatic, the lower one, and one cytotoxic, uh, the higher one. So three major differences and observation we can uh, make here. First, different effects of the same uh, dose on different sphingolipids. For instance, the 500 dose, here it's increasing sphingosine, but on the other hand is decreasing specific uh, molecular species of exosal ceramide. Second, different effects of the same dose on different molecular species of the same sphingolipid. For instance, in this case, this is the hydrocyramide and the C16 uh, species going up, while the C24 is not changed. And third, different effects of different DOX species on the same sphingolipid. And here, for instance, the uh, sphingosine is going up a bit 500, uh, the lower dose, while it's unchanged with the higher dose. So clearly, the two different doses of doxorubicin um, cause different perturbations of sphingolipid metabolism. So as Yusuf mentioned, the sphingolipid pathway is a network of reactions. So which of the branches are causing the changes in lipids that we observed 
as uh, mass changes. So what we can do is to evaluate the changes in the flux through the pathway, um, or in other words, to assess how efficiently the reactions occur. We can assess the uh, biosynthetic uh, branches of the pathway with pulse labeling. And in this case, the precursor is incorporated um, in the same uh, way as the endogenous precursor is. We can, so at this point, um, if there is a difference, this is early. Um, so it's a short pulse. Um, we want to catch it before the uh, steady state is reached. And differences between a control and a treatment are telling us that there is a difference in the incorporation of the precursor um, into the target lipid, suggesting there is a regulation of this biosynthetic node of the pathway. Um, on the other hand, we can also assess the degradation uh, pathway using the chase um, phase. In this case, we label the cells to a steady state, so to equilibrium, and then we measure how fast the label pool of the target lipid is um, decreasing. And again, if there is uh, a difference, that might suggest that uh, um, the treatment is inducing a change in that particular um, uh, degradation pathway. So to follow sphingolipid metabolism, there are several precursors that can be utilized depending on which node of the pathway uh, we want to probe. In fact, they can enter the pathway very uh, early on. And here, for instance, uh, we might use um, isotopically labeled serine or radioactive uh, serine or fatty acids. And uh, others can enter um, further down the pathway and can even just probe one um, single reaction. So recently, uh, uh, our group has developed a method that um, can allow um, to probe the various steps along the biosynthetic pathway sequentially. And to do this, uh, we used the, um, the um, C17 uh, dihydro uh, sphingosine, which is basically a, a natural uh, sphingolipid with 17 carbons instead of the natural 18 carbons. So this, the metabolism of this substrate can be followed um, within the cell uh, by mass spectrometry. And um, so what happens is that the, the uh, precursor um, then enters the, the pathway in a um, sequential manner. And therefore, um, distinct uh, phases of enzymatic reactions can be identified and based on the, the, the time. And so we have a window of the uh, ceramide synthase phase, the desaturase phase, and then the more complex sphingolipid phase. So here is an example of the, the kind of um, results we can obtain from this analysis. So this is again the, the treatment of MCF7 cells with the, the two different doses of TOX. And in this case, here we have the source phase, which is monitored by the production of the hydro C16 ceramide. And, uh, and you can appreciate as the green line is the rate at which the vehicle is um, converting the, the uh, substrate. And the red line is the rate at which the higher dose of uh, doxorubicin is converting the substrate. And so you can see that there is a difference in the rate. And actually, we have an increased um, uh, ceramide um, synthesis phase with the cytotoxic uh, dose of dox. Whereas if you consider, for instance, the, the uh, desaturase phase, then we have uh, the opposite um, scenarios. So basically by using this uh, um, approach, then you, you can uh, assess the different uh, nodes of the sphingolipid uh, pathway and maybe identify some of them which are um, altered by the treatment 
And that brings us to basically the enzymes, as each these nodes are indeed regulated by the, um, the enzymes of the sphingolipid pathway. So very classically, you know, of course, you can uh, assess regulation of the enzymes at the expression level. And uh, here, for instance, Dr. Um, Clark has set up a custom-made sphingolipid array which allows to measure the expression of several sphingolipid genes in the same time. And by using this array, he was able to show, for instance, uh, increased expression of a neutral, a neutral sphingomyelinase 2 uh, upon treatment with um, old transretinoic acid. And he followed up that studies um, um, clarifying the um, mechanism of this regulation. Of course, we can also assess uh, enzymatic activity in vitro. And uh, what's uh, important to note is that uh, um, we can set up this in vitro assay so that we can, using different substrates, we can discriminate between uh, isoenzymes um, of the same um, enzymatic reaction, for instance, uh, DAS1 and 2 or SK1 and 2, the different semases with different pH and um, different um, activating um, factors, um, sources, but some of the isoenzymes cannot be discriminated in vitro, like uh, sphingomyelin synthase 1 and 2. And here for this um, in vitro assay, we can use radioactive isotopically labeled uh, or odd chain substrates, um, fluorescently labeled substrate analogs, and also quenched substrates that will liberate the fluorescence upon enzymatic activity. But so there are a couple of drawbacks when you do in vitro activity, of course. Um, for instance, if there are some misfocalized enzymes that would not be active in cells, um, but those will be picked up as active in vitro. Or else we could uh, lose some of the regulation in the preparation of lysates. So it's a key. Uh, it's, to also assess the activity of the enzymes in situ, so directly in the cells. And we can do that, again, by using some of these um, substrates that uh, can be followed by uh, mass spec or by um, uh, fluorescence. And some of these substrates can, uh, at the same time, for instance, um, inform about the activity of um, a group of the sphingolipid enzymes that reside, for instance, in the Golgi. And so that's the case when you um, label cells with uh, NBD uh, short ceramide analogs, then they go to the Golgi and get metabolized um, by sphingomyelin synthase, uh, glucosyl uh, ceramide synthase, and even by um, uh, ceramide kinase. Then activity in situ um, can be also probed using uh, FRAG probes. This has been optimized for acid smase. It's been worked on uh, acid ceramidase. And how this works is that uh, we have two fluorophores. And this is the sphingomyelin. It's the substrate for the enzyme. Uh, this is the coumarin fluorophore and an MBD fluorophore. So when we um, excite the coumarin, uh, the energy uh, liberated transfers to the NBD and excites the NBD, which is ultimately what uh, emits. And therefore, we see the green uh, fluorescence, which is indicative of sphingomyelin levels. But when the acid sphingomyelinase uh, is active, then it hydrolyzes uh, the phosphocholine uh, out and liberates the NBT. And at this point, when we uh, excite the coumarin, now we have the emission for the coumarin, which is here indicated by the red fluorescence. And so uh, activation of acid smase would increase the fluorescence, the coumarin fluorescence, and would decrease the um, NBD fluorescence. There are also clickable probes, which are sphingolipid probes with small functional groups so that are fed to the cells. And then they can be reacted in, in uh, situ using some fluorescent groups. And so you can also localize um, where these reactions are occurring by microscope. And then there are the quenched uh, probes that liberate 
fluorescence upon enzymatic activity. We can um, again assess the involvement of uh, um, enzymes by using um, inhibitors screens. And so you can again triangulate by using um, these different uh, inhibitors and here are a few of them. And also you can assess enzyme, enzyme uh, expression more traditionally uh, with specific targeted uh, real-time PCR. Um, with specific antibodies, and more recently has been also reported by uh, mass spectrometry for um, specific um, en sphingolipid enzymes. Where in the cells are um, these changing changes occurring? So um, again, we could uh, do we could perform uh, subcellular fractionation, and here are some examples of, of that. Um, these are nuclei isolated from jerk cells treated with um, antifas and showing that uh, upon um, measurement of the sphingolipid, we see an increase in nuclear ceramide. Um, or this is an example of isolating uh, heavy membranes, so enriched in uh, mitochondria or lysosomes, or light membranes enriched in plasma membranes, um, and um, lipid measurements on, on these isolated fractions. We could image um, sphingolipids to understand where these changes are uh, happening. And this can be done using toxins, uh, using uh, specific antibodies, clickable and fluorescent lipids as well. So for instance, the toxins, um, the, some of them uh, bind to the lipid and then are cytotoxic because they make pores on the uh, plasma membrane. And so they could be also used indirectly to measure, um, for instance, sphingomyelin levels as a function of um, toxicity of the, the um, toxin. Otherwise, there are some uh, mutations that can be done so that the uh, toxin binds to the lipid but doesn't um, make the pore, and so the cells are not going to be um, uh, lysed. Um, so these are some of the um, toxins uh, available. And these are some of the antibodies that are uh, available. There are a number for uh, ceramide, and there are others also for um, glycosphingolipids. And another uh, concept uh, and the tools that now is being uh, developed more and more is the imaging of the sphingolipids through mass spectrometry. Mostly it's been conducted on tissues, but uh, more recent advances um, are forthcoming for a single cell uh, imaging um, by the group of Dr. Um, D'Angelo. Now, of course, this is very informative because these can actually um, allow us to show the heterogeneity of the distribution and changes of the sphingolipids within the tissue, which is lost, of course, upon lipid extraction for mass spectrometry. Where in the, in the cells, um, we can mimic sphingolipid changes by altering sphingolipids in specific compartments. And this can be done, for instance, by applying extracellularly um, bacterial um, sphingolipid metabolizing enzymes. This is an example, for instance, of the triangulation of the role of ceramide in um, the dephosphorylation of phosphor um, ERMS proteins. So here is shown how addition of bacterial sphingomyelinase would cause uh, hydrolysis of sphingomyelin, accumulation of ceramide, and that's concomitant with the dephosphorylation of, of ERMS proteins. And then the addition of bacterial uh, ceramidase then can convert this ceramide signal into a, a sphingosine signal. And this, by um, reverting the accumulation of ceramide, restores the phosphorylation of uh, phosphorerms. We can also um, compartmentally target 
uh, sphingolipid enzymes. Um, this has been done for um, uh, ceramides, bacterial ceramides, but also for bacterial sphingomyelinase. And more recently also, um, the ceramide transfer protein has been um, targeted to uh, mitochondria. And we can also mimic lipid effects with compartmentally targeted sphingolipids. So for instance, we have some uh, ceramides like pyridinium ceramides, which are cationic analogs, and target the negatively charged intracellular compartments like mitochondria. Um, we can also um, deliver liposomal ceramide with organelle targeted nanocarriers. This has been um, also pursued. And then we can increase local, for instance, in this case, ceramide levels with organelle tropic inhibitors of sphingolipid enzymes, such as the um, acid um, ceramides inhibitor LCL521. And then finally, downstream targets. So how do we identify downstream targets for um, sphingolipids that are important and maybe they um, reflect functions of these lipids. So um, historically, there have been uh, enzymological studies in which uh, the lipids have been mixed with potential substrate, uh, potential targets, um, such as protein phosphatases um, 1 and 2A, or protein kinase zeta and uh, KSR. But also, this um, Sphingolipids can be used as baits to trap um, direct targets. So this has been done with uh, immobilized ceramide analogs, with clickable probes, and with photoactivatable and um, clickable probes. And by using all these um, uh, approaches, uh, I just compiled the um, a table on some of the uh, targets that direct targets that have been uh, identified for um, ceramide. Um, and this, I'm just reporting the ones that have been find, found commonly between a couple of different approaches. And then a novel also um, functional approach is um, by searching the literature and a functional network identifies direct targets of ceramide and the targets reported substrates. So in this way, the functional networks are built to identify key biological functions that are mediated by um, ceramide and its targets and to potentially assist also in discovering novel functions by using newly discovered associations. So this has been done for ceramide, for sphingosine, and for sphingosine 1-phosphate by um, Dr. Canals. So that's a cool um, you know, approach, alternative approach. And then finally, we can combine lipidomics with other omics to identify altered pathways and functions as a result of uh, sphingolipid changes. So this has been done um, combining lipidomics with proteomics and transcriptomics, and also with um, genetic screens. And here, the group of Dr. Ritzman is um, leading this uh, effort with these two beautiful um, uh, studies. So in summary, we have gone from um, changes in the sphingolipid levels and we have investigated um, where are these changing changes from in terms of which um, nodes of the uh, metabolic pathways are altered. Um, we have investigated um, specific enzymes and their regulation in these changes. Um, we have assessed subcellular localization of these changes. And finally, we have attempted to identify sphingolipid targets. And with that, I would like, I mean, we, we really have gone a long way from the identification of the first sphingolipid 
to this. And this is thanks to all the students, postdocs and principal investigators who have contributed to and advanced the sphingolipid research during the years. Um, we would like to, to thank this for um, outstanding uh, researchers for um, helping and giving inputs on this presentation. And finally, I would like to uh, dedicate today's presentation to Dr. Obeid, um, who's an esteemed scientist and pillar in the sphingolipid field, a compassionate clinician, selfless mentor and uh, role model, an unwavering friend. So without Lina's contribution and leadership, many of the tools and discoveries discussed today would not be available. And I thank you all for um, listening. And we, yes, it will entertain some questions. And if you have more questions, um, these are our um, email addresses. And just feel free to um, send us your questions and comments. And thank you. Thank you very much, Chiara, and thank you also, Yusuf. So at this point, we'll go through uh, some of the questions that we've received so far and more can be submitted. We'll deal with them until time runs out. The first one was actually an analytical question, so I'll go ahead and answer that one myself, which was wondering how to quantify the total abundance of sphingolipids using uh, MRM, multiple reaction monitoring uh, mode of mass spectrometry. The, uh, there are quite a few papers that are out uh, discussing that methodology, but one of the ones that I would recommend selfishly is a Journal of Lipid Research paper by Shana et al. from my laboratory. And I selfishly picked that one, not uh, only because of ego, but because in the paper we map out a lot of the principles that I mentioned in my uh, introduction about uh, what one needs to do to validate uh, that the numbers that you get are accurate. For example, it talks about uh, establish and, and demonstrates for the samples that were analyzed, uh, validating extraction efficiency across the whole chain length species of sphingolipids that were found in the biological sample. Ta uses a range of chain length uh, and head group variant uh, internal standards and that sort of thing. So that would, I think, be a good place to start uh, for that. The second question uh, could be either to uh, Chara or Yusuf because it asks, in multiple steps, if multiple steps of the pathway change at the same time, for example, both upregulation of synthesis and degradation, how would you know that? Um, well, for instance, you know, when you do pulse chase, you have the ability to um, determine if a biosynthetic node is altered. And at the same time, you can assess whether the degradation um, of a specific uh, sphingolipid is altered. So, I mean, you can definitely probe uh, both and that would be done by using specific precursors. So for instance, if one is um, interested in sphingomyelinase, you know, the classical way has been done. Maybe you um, label with choline, you know, radioactive choline um, to steady state. And then in the, in the chase, you measure how um, rapidly the sphingomyelin is uh, degraded. Now then, of course, that begs the question then, uh, which enzyme is regulating that degradation and, uh, and that needs to be probed a little bit more um, specifically at that point. Uh, thank you. We have two questions about localization. <clears throat> One says, is it possible to identify if lipids are interacting at a certain point, such as in rafts, and how could that be analyzed? And the second one specifically talks about, um, is there a way to visualize the sterile uh, component uh, of what would be inside the cell um, by fluorescence or some other methodology? So I think those can both be dealt with uh, by one person answering. Uh, 
well, for instance, one, one example of the um, um, interacting lipid, um, one of the toxin, the um, one of the toxins um, binds the sphingomyelin and cholesterol complexes. So. Um, that could be a tool if you're interested in something like that. Um, <clears throat> two different lipids. Um, uh, that's a tough one, I think. I, I think the study of raft is a really tough one because they're not defined in a very specific way. So there are different approaches that different investigators use to study rafts and each, and there's several approaches that are not identical, uh, whether it's a detergent insoluble membranes uh, or um, other aspects of uh, study that, or microscopy or other. So it, there's, a lot of undefined parameters surrounding RAP. So it's very difficult, I think, to precisely study them. But that's within the larger question of, I guess, where it comes down to, are the functions of these lipids being mediated by effects primarily on, lip, on the lipid membrane structure, or are they due to interaction with specific targets, whether those occur in rafts or not, becomes almost irrelevant. Meaning if S1P, sphingosine phosphate, works on one of its uh, G-protein coupled receptors, that's a direct target and doesn't, you know, whether it's in rafts or not, I don't think advances the study much. However, for some species of ceramide, are they modulating the membrane structure? Uh, a lot has been done, very nice work in vitro to tell us that there is modulation of structure of membranes by ceramides, but in cells, I think that's been rather deficient and primarily from at least our point of view, uh, we, if we look at specific ceramides, these are present in usually very low concentrations. It's difficult to see how they could perturb membranes in general. Now, a hybrid scenario is these lipids could perturb structure in their own vicinity and therefore can regulate functions of some proteins in those vicinities. But then that becomes, again, a, a target for the lipid rather than a general change, let's say, in Golgi structure because there is slightly more C18 ceramide than C22, for example. That's, that's, I, I agree. I think that's the uh, closest one can get right now. Another question regards using the odd chain sphingoid base as a, uh, a probe, since there are uh, some uh, odd chain, small amounts usually of odd chain sphingoid bases. And I'll answer that one quickly since time is running out. And it's, it is true that any time that one uses uh, methodologies you first have to determine what the endogenous amounts are of species because sometimes they're not detectable, sometimes they're major species. So the first step in any of these types of, of protocols is to uh, determine baseline and then monitor that uh, as you uh, perturb the system to make sure that you don't start forming these sorts of species. Um, but it is correct that one has to check that before you use any of these uh, tools. And then I think we're out of time. There were any of the other questions, but thank you very much for uh, listening to the presentation and sending your questions, which you can direct to the presenters, as we've said earlier. And thank you very much, uh, Yusuf and Chiara, for helping out with this Lipid Maps workshop. Thank you Ab, for putting it together. And thanks for the audience for participating. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.